Uh, I think it's kind of funny that some of you got your phones out. Like, if he falls, this is going into America's Funniest Home Videos. So, uh, man, who's glad to be at church this morning? Yeah? Good. We're glad you're here. Um, we can bring that music down. Appreciate it. Uh, my, my daughter, if you guys don't know, I have two daughters. My daughter is six-year-old. Uh, she just turned six on Christmas Eve, and we celebrate in January. And how many people know what she asked for for her birthday? Uh, she wanted a hoverboard. Now, obviously, it's not my hoverboard. I don't want a pink hoverboard. I want a purple one. But, uh, <laughs> but she asked for a hoverboard, and I was like, well, first off, uh, Marty McFly knows what a real hoverboard is, and that's why I got my Marty McFly shoes. There's wheels on this. It doesn't float, but I knew what she was talking about, and so uh, we decided to give her a hoverboard. We, like, we went all in, got her a hoverboard, and uh, I've been practicing a lot, if you haven't told. Like, look at this. I'm pretty good. She's better. But uh, so I got her the hoverboard and uh, we went in all in it. And when we brought it home, it was still winter. It was icy out. It was cold out. And so obviously we didn't want her to have to wait to ride outside. So we were going to let her ride inside. She's like, please, 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 daddy, please, daddy, let me ride it inside. And so we're like, okay. But before she rode, as a father, I said, we need to give you some riding instructions before you ride this thing, especially if you're riding in the house. So just, you know, the simple things like don't go too fast in the house, right? Watch out for the entertainment center and the TV. I need that, right? Uh, watch out for Charlie, our little, our little daughter, and watch out for her toes. Don't be chasing Wrigley, our eight-pound dog, around <laughs> the house. No ramps, no knives, no anything like, I know I got a little intense, but I was just making sure I covered all the bases because she could be have a knife like, there, look at the knife. You want it? There you go. <laughs> So I covered all those bases, and how many people know my job as a father wasn't to take away from her hoverboard experience, it was to help her have the best hoverboard experience. Because I know one thing, the same hoverboard that was going to bring a lot of laughter, joy in her life could be the same hoverboard that could really hurt her, bring a lot of agony, and maybe have her suffer where she can't get back up. Welcome to our brand new series called Swipe Right, as we talk about the life and death power of sex and romance. See, God does the same exact thing with us as I did with Avery on the hoverboard. He's given us instructions. Why? Because he knows something about sex. That it's one thing that can bring joy and laughter, but it also can knock the wind out of us, knock us on our tails, and we could be suffering to even get back up. And so he's given us instructions before we use it. And so that's why we're talking about for the next four weeks, and it's going to be good, it's going to be fun, it's going to be enjoyable. If you're here, I just want to let you know, maybe you're, if you're a follower or not a follower, this series is for everyone. Just in case you kind of, I'm married, it's for married people. I'm not married, it's for non-married people. It's for people who have lost their virginity. It's for people who still have the Virginity Rocks t-shirt and the Joe Jonas promise ring on. It's for people who are having one night stands right now where people say, no, that's just not my deal. It's for people who have been hurt and pain and maybe have been uh, taken the innocence from them. It's for people who have been living in a pure life. It's for every single person that's in this place right now. I truly believe that God has asked us as a church to talk about this subject called Swipe Right as we learn about the life and death power of sex and romance. And maybe it's for believers for sure, but if you're an unbeliever and you're not a follower of Christ, I would encourage you that you can still practice this and find freedom in sex. You don't don't have to be a follower of Jesus to put these principles in place, but being a follower of Jesus will give it a whole lot more purpose if you do. God's that good, and so that's what we're going to talk about in this series. But I want to leave you with the scripture in Proverbs 16:25. I'm going to put it on the screen. Uh, king Solomon, the wisest king to ever live, empowered by the Holy Spirit, wrote these words in Proverbs. He said, "There is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. There is a path before each person that seems right." But it ends in death. And I'm not trying to say the path you are on is leading to death, but maybe you've been traveling on this path for a while and it keeps leaving you high and dry. Maybe you feel like you're left out. Maybe you're feeling pain and agony and hurt. And my job as a pastor today is maybe, just maybe, I can give you a new path. A path that leads to life. A path that leads to joy. A path that leads to freedom. Come on, church, if you want a path that leads to God's best for your life, that's what we're here to talk about. We cheer for it, but when it becomes God's scripture, sometimes it's hard to live. So the name of this message, if you're writing notes today, it's Let's Talk About Sex. Let's Talk About Sex. Kudos if you started singing that song in your mind. <laughs> Father God, I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our church. I know, Father God, as we talk about these heavy issues, sometimes people don't know what's going to come. Maybe people who've been shamed, who've been hurt by it. I pray that this would be a place full of your grace. I pray that this would be a place that we talk about these things because Jesus talked about them. We see it throughout scripture. We see everything that you're doing, Father God. I pray, Father God, by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would work in us 
that you would work through us. And Lord, that we believe, Father God, that you want to bring sexy back into the right place, Lord. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're not going to take long to jump in to this. Let's talk about sex. Now, if you're here, we have these out in our merch section. It's called Swipe Right. This book and this series has kind of been inspired by this guy named Levi Lusco, a great pastor in Montana. We have like 10 copies out there. So if they go good, we'll get more next week. There's 10 copies at the merch section. I would encourage you, no matter what stage of life you're in, if you've got to teach your kids about this, get this book. If you're learning this for the first time, get this book. It's called Swipe Right. It's out there. But I wanted to give credit where credit is due. You might read this and be like, hmm. He stole some of that. Every week I steal stuff from pastors. <laughs> There's nothing new under the sun. Like, I'm myself, but they have good stuff. We learn from other people. We learn from other people. So let's talk about sex and what God says. The first thing we need to understand is sex is pleasurable. Sex is pleasurable. Now, let's look back at the hoverboard. Uh, the reason I got my daughter a hoverboard, the reason we got my daughter a hoverboard is why? For her to have fun. So she could enjoy it. So she could laugh. So we could see the smile on her face. So when she's flying through the house, she's like, this is awesome. That's why we got her the hoverboard. Because what father and what parents would not want to get their kids a gift that brings joy? It's the same when it comes to sex when we talk about it. Some people don't like to talk about it in church because it's a taboo thing. But God created it and it's a good gift from above. And a whole lot more men should be saying amen after that. (laughs) Oh, I can't say that. That's weird. But it's true. It's true. Now, listen, uh, let me just give you a background on my church experience. With my church experience, I was raised in church, and uh, people in my church, they had, the well, they had a well-intentioned heart. So I'm not here trying to dog on my church experience. I was raised in church, and I'm grateful for people who poured into me. But even people with well-intentioned hearts sometimes get the wrong message across. And, uh, and so my whole life growing up, sometimes I heard sex more like this. Sex is bad. Sex is dirty. Sex is gross. It's ucky, so save it for your wife. (laughs) Save it for your husband. Gross, nasty, wait till you're married, right? But the thing is, is you have this, and it actually reverses the effect because people start seeing it, and it has filtered actually outside of the church that when we talk about things like this, people outside of church already think they know where people stand in the church, that sex is gross, sex is bad, shame on them, and we look like Ned Flanders from The Simpsons, right? That's who we are. That's who we've become. And so they don't want to hear about it, and they don't. Some of you are Simpsons fans. <laughs> uh, my goal is not to join this for four weeks and tell you how bad sex is. That is not my goal. My goal is to tell you just how great sex is. I'm a huge fan. Like I'm, <laughs> like I'm just being, I'm being real with you. We've always been a real church. Like if there was a team jersey, I'd be wearing the jersey every single day. Like I'm a big fan. It's a great thing. You're like, this is cringe, mom. I don't want to come back. Listen in a little bit more. I'm a big fan, and honestly, there should be more worshiping happening every Sunday, especially you married people. You should just be worshiping for that one reason, that we have this. But let's be honest. Sex isn't just on our mind. It was on God's mind. Sex wasn't just on our mind. It was on God's mind. So much that in the creation, when we talk about heaven and earth were made and light and darkness, he creates, right, in six days, the seventh day he rests. He creates man and woman on the sixth day, man and woman on the sixth day after he created everything. And the first thing he tells them, the very first instructions he says is, have sex. You don't believe me, do you? You're like, pastor, I want scripture right now. Let me show you. Genesis 1, 27 through 28. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. The Sean Living translation is have sex and have babies. That's what he's saying. (laughs) Be fruitful and multiply. Guys, it's the gift that keeps on giving because when we begin to understand that he created this for other people to experience, babies and children, and children are a blessing from God is what scripture says. Sex is a gift. Why? Because it procreates. It fills our homes. It fills our lives. Children are a blessing from God. It's a gift. And if you're here today, you said, Sean, I want to cheer for that, but I can't have children. Me and my husband have been trying. I want to let you know that there's no shame here. And I want to let you know that you're in a church where there's been people who have been told they're sterile and can't have kids. And God has blessed them with children because he can do the impossible. He's a good God, and he can move on your behalf too. And even beyond that, some people in here 
were told the same thing, and guess what? They still didn't have biological children, but they have fostered children, and they have adopted children, and they have helped people, and God has brought fulfillment to their life, which I believe if you follow Jesus, he will fulfill the purpose, and all your pain can be served for a purpose in your life. So please don't hear me wrong, but the pleasure of sex is to procreate. It's to bring children. It's about procreation, but sex isn't just about procreation. It's about recreation, too. Come on, somebody. (laughs) Come on, we're in Illinois. There's a lot of recreational stuff happening, legal stuff happening this year. If one thing, let's cheer for the thing God brought into it. Now, listen, it's not just for procreation. I'm going to show you in Scripture that's also for recreation. This is what God's Word says. Now, I'm going to warn you. (laughs) It's going to get steamy. (laughs) It's going to get a little hot. (laughs) Like, it's going to get like, whoo, you might blush a little bit, like, the book we're about to go to is this guy named Song of Solomon, he, the same one who wrote Proverbs. He wrote about lovers talking about themselves in a very detailed way. Imagine two people who are like been married for a year texting each other like before they get home. Like this is the stuff that's happening. You're like we never had that. You missed out. That's the best stuff. Anyways, just make sure you're not in a group text. That's happened to me and Liz before. That's awkward. <laughs> They're like, oh really? I'm like, you shouldn't have saw that. I'm never coming back to that church. Uh, This is the book of the Bible that literally makes every boy in youth group blush when we go to it. Like, this is the book that all the Christian kids, when they go to school and say, have you ever seen an R-rated movie? They go, no, but I've read Song of Solomon. Like, that's, (laughs) that's this book. There's a lot of sex talk in this book. I'm warning you. There's a lot of talk about lovemaking and the intimacy of it, but there's no talk about children. This is the sp- specifically to talk about the joy and pleasure sex is between, in, in, in between a man and a woman. There's intimacy in it. It's for procreation, but it's also for recreation. You ready to read this? I don't think you're ready. If you need to close your kids' ears, go for it now. Song of Solomon. This is in the Bible. 7, starting in verse 6, it says, Oh, how beautiful you are. How pleasing, my love. Hold on. This doesn't sound right at all. Hey, guys, can you help me out real quick? And the Bible's great. It's good stuff. But honestly, though, this reveals the intimacy that is beyond two people. Everybody, the joy and the pleasure. Guys, sex is not gross. It's not weird. We need to stop acting like it is. We need to start telling, stop telling our kids it is. It's enjoyable. It's a gift from God. And I need to be realize that a culture that keeps talking about sex, the church needs to step it up and bring sexy back and say, hey, God created this first. He knows how to talk about it. He knows how to handle it. But this isn't just scripture, guys. This is science. I've read so many studies this week, and it says sex and marriage can help with stress, lower blood pressure, cut the risk of cancer, boost your immunity. It's flu season, so get going. (laughs) Sleep better, prevent heart attack, drive away depression, look younger and attractive. So be careful next time you go, you look so young. (laughs) Spur self-esteem. And bring comfort and closeness. Guys, make no mistake, sex is a gift. It's a pleasurable gift. God's created it. It's something valuable. It's something pleasurable. It's not everything. We need to start off like this before we go into Swipe Right. We have a better understanding that, hey, I don't know what you've heard about it, maybe you're raising it, what you've heard from the church, but God created it, and it's a good, 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 good gift. But the same person who wrote in Song of Solomon, they actually wrote this in Song of Solomon 8.4. It says this. The same people who wrote that said, Promise me, O women of Jerusalem, not to awaken love until the time is right. 
not to awaken love. So they understood it's an intimate thing. It's a pleasurable thing. It's something that's great that's been given by God. But the, the person in Song of Solomon also knows there's a right time and a wrong time. Why? Because sex may be pleasurable, but sex is also powerful. It's powerful. That's your next point. Sex is powerful. God knows that sex is definitely pleasurable, but he also knows it's very, very powerful. You see, we have to understand that God understands this because he knows, just like the hoverboard, that the same thing that can bring joy and pain is the same thing that can bring agony, or the joy and pleasure is the same thing that can bring agony and pain and hurt. So he put a warning label on it so people knew how to use it right. Why? Because there's power in instructions. When the manufacturer puts instructions on an item or an object, it's to protect the user who's using it. Come on, guys. How many times did we not read the instructions and it gave us a headache? (laughs) Instructions bring power. So we got to understand it is pleasurable, but the same thing that can help in a marriage is the same thing that is ruining a culture every single day. I mean, hurting, broken, regrets, STDs, broken marriages, uh, people not being prepared. Abortion is on that list. You're like, why is abortion on it? Because people think that we can just treat babies as expendable and just get away with our pleasure. Sex is causing a lot of pain. But it was gifted by God. So we need instructions. We need instructions. If you're here like, man, I'm not welcome to this church because I've had an abortion, you are definitely welcome to this church. If you've had an abortion or haven't had one, you're in the right place. God can restore. He can redeem. You are valuable. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying there's a lot of pain that comes from not reading the instructions. So God gives us instructions. Why? Because he wants us to enjoy it right. And people are like, well, that, he's a party pooper. You don't, call, you don't call Apple party poopers because they instruct you not to take your iPhone in the shower. They're not phonophobic because they tell you to do that. They're saying it. Why? So you can get the best out of your iPhone. And God's giving you instructions and I instructions. Why? So we can get the best out of the thing he created. He's for us, not against us. And so, Sean, what's this warning label? What's this instruction? Well, let's go back to Genesis. It says this in 224 when he brings two uh, people together. He says, here's the instructions. Sex is pleasurable. But here is the instructions for followers of Christ. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. That word united means joined. It means stuck together, put together. It's consummated in sex and marriage. They have been joined together. And some people say, Sean, that's Genesis. That's old. Jesus is here. He's at the new. He's awesome. It's great. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because in Matthew 19, 6, Jesus actually reiterates this scripture in one of his teachings. And in Mark, Mark gets the gospel too. In Mark 10, 7, he says, yes, Jesus uses the same scripture and reminds them, this is the instruction when it comes to this gift called sex. And so much so, Paul, after Jesus dies, rises again, his disciples start the church, churches are flo- like blossoming everywhere, there's a church in Corinth, and they're the church gone wild, like they're crazy, like they're like us, like come on, let's be honest, like they're the church that's like, they love Jesus, but they look far from Jesus because they're on this journey, but they're growing, but they were so far from Christ, bunch of Gentiles, lots of, lots of um, freedom, lots of money, and they were just enjoying every gift that God gave them, but not the right way, and so Paul in in the Corinthians, actually 1 Corinthians 6, 16, uses this scripture to remind them, hey, I know those desires are there. I know you have a sex drive, but you can't let sex drive. He says, this is what it's for. Here's the instruction. Why? Because we want you to have freedom in your marriage. We want you to help them. God was not trying to make it complex. He made it simple and clear so we could understand them. So what is he saying? Sex is to be enjoyed in a marriage relationship between one man and one woman who have left their parents to start a brand new journey and have made a lifelong commitment. That's what he's saying. Like, Sean, but man, he's so, look at his washboard abs. Like, we're going to get married someday. I know it. I know we will. Well, if someday's going to happen, then why hasn't he put a ring on it yet? Because if he's not going to treat you with valuable and say, oh, this is a commitment, if he has to test drive the car before he can buy it, he's not committed to you. He's committed to himself. And vice versa, because there's some freaky girls out there, too. (laughs) Someone said amen, I think. Amen! (laughs) But listen, he says it's for a marriage relationship between one man and one woman. That's it. Sex works properly when it's in its proper place. That's what God is saying. But when it's not in proper place, it can wreak havoc and bring a lot of judgment on our lives. I've seen this... um, 
We, uh, just like uh, last week or two weeks ago, I went out to Odell to hang out with Jim Haley. He's a part of our church. He helped us start the church. He's a trustee here. And uh, so I, I get to meet with him. We have, you know, phone calls, meet, talk about different things, and uh, pray together, encourage each other. And I went out to the Hearthside Shop. And if you guys don't know, Jim owns a Hearthside Shop out in Odell, and he sells wood uh, fireplaces and wood pellet fireplaces and stoves, like old-fashioned ones for the house. If you need one, go buy one at Hearthside Shop. If you buy anywhere else, I'm going to find you. No, I'm just kidding. So... <laughs> It's a shameless plug, but they're awesome. And so I went to his shop, and his shop is really big. It's like an old barn crib that he redid. It's really cool. Even if you go out to see it, just go experience it sometime. It's really neat. And so we went in there, and I was talking to him, and it was like 10 degrees. And I remember walking in there and just amazed how warm it was because of the stove about this big. There was a raging fire happening in that cast iron stone. I mean, it was, it was raging. It was hot, but the, the stove was closed. And that one thing was heating up the entire shop. And I thought that was crazy that this fire that could bring so much hurt contained in this space could eat up the or could heat up the whole shop. And I thought about that because that's exactly how God created sex. Sex in the proper place can heat up an entire marriage. But when you take it out of the contained place in the proper place, it can destroy a home and take lives. And we're seeing this happening because it's got to be in its proper place. That's why God put a giant red letter warning label on it because he knew it would be mismanaged and he, wouldn't, he didn't want havoc and judgment in our lives. And so he's trying to protect us. Remember, as a father with his daughter in the hoverboard, I was trying to save her and protect her. We have to trust our father and trust our God. And so he says, here's what sex is for. Here's the proper place. And then Paul, they say it's Paul in Hebrews. I'm going to read a scripture. They say it was Paul who said this, but there's this one other encouragement for those in the marriage bed or before the marriage bed. He says this in Hebrews 13, 4. It says, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Now, let me unpack this before it seems very strong what's going on, because sometimes we look at Scripture like, here it comes, here it comes. I'm just going to, marriage should be honored by all, the marriage kept, bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. Now listen, first and foremost, Paul was, be, let me unpack this, the context makes sense. Paul was considered to write this Scripture. Whoever it was, we know the Holy Spirit inspired them. So the Holy Spirit wanted this to be instructed. Now, he was writing to an audience of Jewish believers. Jewish believers were people who believed the Old Testament, they had the law, the 613 laws that they had to abide by, the, Mos the Mosaic law, the Ten Commandments. And then Jesus came and preached. A lot of the Pharisees and the people who put him on the cross were Jewish people, and they still don't believe that Jesus was the Son of God, and they still to this day believe that the Messiah hasn't come yet. But there's also these Messianic Jews. There's Jews at the time who begin to believe that Jesus truly was the Son of God. They're Jewish, but they also believe that Jesus fulfilled the Mosaic law. He filled the great commandments. He did it by grace because nothing we can do can make us right with God, but Jesus did it. And he's writing to these believers who have put their faith in Christ, are brand new, and he's writing to them. These people are filling churches. They're in churches everywhere. And Paul is writing to them in Hebrews, a Jewish believers. Not just that, but in Hebrews 13, it literally says these are Paul's concluding words. Meaning, before he's done writing the letter, he's like, what else do I need to? What? Oh, oh yeah, I better put this in there too. This was some of his he was like, before I go, you got to know this. You need to honor marriage by all and keep the marriage bed pure. Who is he writing to? A bunch of followers of Christ. So we need to understand today, i got to put my foot down in a nice and gentle way and realize if we are claiming to follow Jesus, the way, the Messiah, he's made us brand new, this instruction is not just for the Jewish believers, it's for us followers of Christ today too. So we need to understand that I'm not just saying here's, here's a... Here's just a suggestion. No, this is a declaration for our life. This is how we live our life as followers of Christ. We don't get to pick and choose like trail mix. I'll eat that one, but that's gross. We have to do all of it. And people say, well, I guess they have to abide by it because it's in there. No, no, no. Remember, we didn't follow Jesus just to follow some rules. We follow Jesus because he leads to life. And if Jesus leads to life, then his teaching leads to life. So we don't just do it because it's suggested. We do it because God is for us and he's leading us to life. So change your mindset. God's not trying to ruin your fun. He's preparing you for the best fun you've ever had in your life. I'm telling you, just trust him. Just trust him with it, please. So we don't pick and choose. So he says, marriage should be honored by all. So what is Paul saying? First off, he says this word honor. This word honor is the word timios in the Greek. You really don't need to know that. I don't know why I told you. Sometimes I say it because it makes me sound smarter, and I'm not. 
You don't have to walk around going, oh, I Timmy asked you. I'm like, that's weird. Don't do that. But this word actually means as of great price. It means precious. He says, honor marriage, right? It's precious. It's costly. And there's this word he uses. It's valuable. Marriage is valuable. Why is Paul instructing a culture and a church to be uh, looking at marriage honorable? Why? Because if you don't see something as valuable, then you will treat it like it's expendable. If you don't see something as valuable, you'll treat it like it's expendable. See, if you don't see a homeless person as valuable, you'll treat them as expendable. If you don't see people who come to our church who are far and all, maybe addicted to drugs, they don't smell like you, they don't act like you, they don't talk like you, and you treat them like they're not valuable even though Jesus died for them, then you'll treat them as expendable and you won't let them inside these doors. But not our church because every single person is valuable to God. But if you don't see marriage as valuable, you'll treat it as expendable. How do I know this? Uh, my girls, we have a china cabinet. Who has a china cabinet at their house? You know what that is? Anyone who doesn't know what a china cabinet is, it's just where you buy plates and you put it in there and you never use them. <laughs> Ever. And uh, unless someone comes over and you might. But in our china cabinet, we have two, like, someone gave us these, like, teacups. I mean, they're like porcelain. They look like they're from France from the 1920s. They're not. I should take them on that auction road show and see how much money. Don't tell the girls. And, uh, and so they have these things that someone blesses us with because they love tea parties. Now, when we get those things out, the girls know, Daddy, Daddy, can we have a tea party, please? Can we have a tea party with the real teacups, please, please? They know. We'll be very careful. We will be so careful. We'll sit at the table. We'll, we'll hold it like this. We'll put our pinkies out. Like, we'll make sure that our hands are, we'll take care. We'll wash it. We'll put it right back where it is. Can we please, 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 please? How much do you know that there's a difference between that than, hey, Daddy, can we have a tea party? And you give them a styrofoam cup, right? Like the styrofoam cup, they'll put whatever they want in it. They'll start using it as a drum. They'll take styrofoam plates and use them as Frisbees, and they'll be thrown away. And then when they're done with them, we just throw them in the trash, right? You don't treat the fine china like that. Why? Because the fine china is valuable. Styrofoam, expendable. And we live in a culture that's made sex like a styrofoam cup when it's always been fine china. Always been fine china. And here's the truth. Here's the truth. When we begin to use it like it's expendable, then we just toss it anytime we can. We toss it anywhere. And the truth of the matter is we got to understand marriage is valuable. People are like, I might, this might work out. No, if you're going to say I do, you better know that you're going to say I do, and you're going to fight till death do you part. Yeah. It is ordained by God. It's something. One of, the best, one of the best testimonies we can live, and this isn't the shame, one of the best testimonies we can live as followers of Christ is when we say I do to a man or a woman that we would look like Jesus because he says he's coming for his bride. God created marriage. It was his idea, and we should have the strongest marriages in the church to be a testament of God and who he is. And if you haven't, God can redeem it. But what I'm trying to get to in this point was it's valuable. And the girls knew, I got to take care of it. I got to treat it as valuable. He says, treat the marriage as valuable. And not just that, sex is valuable. And beyond that, there's some people in here, the reason you're doing it, you, you may think marriage is valuable. You may think sex is valuable. But the truth is you don't see yourself as valuable. And that breaks my heart because Jesus paid a high price for you. And you know how you know something valuable is? By the price that was paid for it. And Jesus died for you. That's a high price. You're valuable. You're worth it. Don't let anyone just have that. I tell my girls right now, last night, I forgot their flowers for the day daughter dance. It's always get them flowers. I forgot them, guys. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I've already get them a dozen roses sometime this week. Why? Because I don't want some punk kid in high school bringing them one flower going, here's your flower. They said, my daddy never got me a flower. I want them to be like, here's your flower. He goes, my daddy buys me 24 flowers, punk. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm valuable. I'm worth it. Your God, your father wants you to know you're worth it. So be careful. What gets put in you? Be careful who handles you. Be careful who's messing with you. You are fine china. You are supposed to be taken care of and handled well. I'm talking to men and women because there's some, there's some cougars out there. I'm telling you what. Men are like, I don't know what to do. I just gave in. Like, right? Like, you're valuable. Paul says, honor the marriage bed and keep it pure. How? By staying away from adultery and sexual immorality. That's what he says. So, Sean, obviously we know adultery is when you're in a marriage relationship, you are having an affair with someone else. And this isn't just a physical affair. This can be a mental affair. This can be a spiritual affair. This can be watching things on the screen that your wife doesn't know about because Jesus says if you look at a wife or if you look at a lady with lust, you've already committed adultery in your heart. He's trying to, for us to bring sexy back to have free marriages. But he also says this word sexual morality. What's that word? The Greek word is this. It might shock you. Pornos. 
It's where we get the word pornography. And this word means fornication, it means unlawful sexual intercourse, and it means outside of marriage. So Paul isn't just talking about marriage you're in right now. He's saying you can keep the marriage bed pure today even if you're single. He says whatever you're doing right now, it's going to go into the marriage bed with you. I'm trying to say you can prepare. Like, Sean, I'm not in marriage yet. He's not talking about just in marriage. He's saying right now. Why? Paul knows something. He says you don't just hit it and quit it. You don't just have Netflix and chill. You don't just have one night stand and one night of entertainment with porn. All those things you're having is getting brought into the bed with you when you get married. And he says, protect that place. Keep it honorable. Keep it clean. Keep it pure. Why? Because your wife is going to thank you. Your husband's going to thank you. You're going to thank you. And I can tell you from my first hand that it is the best to wait until you get married. Why? He's like, it's like super glue. You can super glue your fingers together. You'll eventually get it off. But you'll take skin from one thumb to the finger, and you'll take skin from the finger to the thumb, and there'll be pieces of that with you forever. Pieces that go with us. Sex is the most pleasurable when it's viewed as valuable. He says, don't take these things into the marriage bed. I thought about this. My wife and I have celebrated nine years of marriage um, just two weeks ago. Nine years we've been married. We're so excited about that, and I'm glad that you guys are cheering for whatever. So. <laughs> Not like, should I be married 25? Like, we need to celebrate those who've been married for one year. Come on, in the culture, yeah! Woo! Nine years. Uh, we've been celebrating nine years, and I remember the, the day we got married like it was yesterday. We did a first look. I remember she tapped on my shoulder, and I turned around, and for the first time I saw her in her wedding dress, and it was gorgeous. It was beautiful. I remember just thinking that moment the first time. I was so, my breath was taken away seeing her in that wedding dress, seeing it with her on. And I was so ecstatic because in a few hours I would get to see it with her off. <laughs> and so I was so pumped. And I thought about that, like when we were engaged, when she said yes to the dress, could you imagine like while we were engaged, she said yes to the dress. And one night I was like, hey, you know what? Before we get married, I want to go to the 4-H fair. That's what we're going to do. We're going to go to the 4-H fair because nothing says romance like a bunch of cars running into each other and some funnel cakes. And so I go to pick her up and sure enough, I knock on the door and I open the door and she's got her wedding dress on. Like, well, that's where I'm like, you wearing that? She goes, yep, I feel like this is a perfect outfit for the 4-H fair. I'm like, okay, because I don't, you know, we're going to get married, so let's, let's go. You know, so she gets mud on it and all these things. And two weeks later, like, let's go for a dinner and a movie. So I go and pick her up, and sure enough, she's wearing her wedding dress. She spills a spaghetti on her from Biagi's, and then she gets a little bit of buttery popcorn because she loves buttery popcorn. It gets everywhere. And then sure enough, we go to a Bulls game, wedding dress. We go paintballing, wedding dress. We go wash the car, go hiking at Star of Rock, wedding dress, wedding dress. Sure enough, by the time we get married, could you imagine when I do the first look and she taps my shoulder and I go, oh, that again. <laughs> She's got the nacho cheese on it from the movies, or the Bulls game. She's got the dirt and everything smeared and everything that she brought. And you see, the wedding dress that was supposed to be treated as valuable became casual. And because it was casual, everything that she picked up for the last year has been brought into the marriage. And he's trying to say, look at the wedding dress. Isn't it crazy that women, today's culture, we treat the wedding dress like it is pristine and valuable. Like we're like, you cannot see the wedding dress before. You cannot see the wedding dress before. You cannot see the wedding dress before. We treat the wedding dress more valuable than the girl itself. Wow. He says, no, no, you're far more worth a price. Don't take this into your marriage bed. Actually, this is science again. This is, in a, this is actually a quote that I found from WebMD. That's right, I WebMD'd it. Benefits in delaying sex until marriage. Look at this. Couples who delay sex until wedding night have more stable and happier marriages than couples who have premarital sex. Sexual quality is 15% higher. Relationship stability is 22% higher. Satisfaction with relationship is 20% higher. Another study says sexually active singles have the most sexual problems, get the least pleasure out of sex, and are more likely to experience depression. And that is included with the pornography addiction as well. So I guess what we're finding out in here is he says no more trying to test drive the car before you buy it. He says the best way to have sex is wait until you get married and then make up for lost time. That's what he's saying. <laughs> Just wait and figure this thing out together and come together and do this together. Sex is pleasurable, but it's very powerful. These are the simple instructions. That's all I got. This is it. It's not really intense. It's not crazy. It's these simple instructions. But how many people know that the simple instructions are sometimes the hardest to follow? Just ask Adam and Eve, right? You can have all this, but not that tree. Did you say this tree, God, right here? This one, right here, oh, right? Like, 
Simple instructions are sometimes the hardest to follow for a father who cares about us, who loves us and cares about us. You know what else I know? Ask my six-year-old daughter. Because after laying down the guidelines, saying, here's how to operate the hoverboard inside the house. I came home from work one day, and my, my wife's like, you might need to talk to your daughter. I was like, what happened? She goes, well, she got catapulted from the hoverboard today. <laughs> so I found out that on the hoverboard, when you go fast, it starts beeping, telling you you're going fast. You need to slow down. My daughter's like me. She pushes it to the edge. She's like, I got to get that thing to beep, right? Like, whoo, beep, beep. And so she wants to do that. The only thing is, I'd probably let her do that outside. But inside of a small living room with four walls on each side, it's a different story because you have to speed up and stop before you get to the wall. She did not stop before she got to the wall. The one thing I said, don't go too fast in the house. Why? Because I know that you could get hurt. It could bring pain. It's your choice, Avery, but don't. She made the choice that brought pain in her life and knocked the wind out of her. She hurt her arm, and she's just like, Ugh. like you know when someone gets the wind knocked out of them? Like, it's, it's sad, but it's like really funny. And you're like, <laughs> are you okay? <laughs> She's fine. But the choice that she chose brought pain in her life. God has laid out the instructions for us. One of the hardest things as a pastor to realize is I have to trust in the Holy Spirit because I can lay it before you as God says it, but it's still your choice. It's still our choice to trust your Father to trust that he actually has peace in this, to trust that I know sometimes it sounds archaic and it's traditional and that's just not what it is anymore, to believe that, you know what, if I'm a follower of Christ and I truly sing those songs and believe that God is for me and not against me, then I know that his instruction is for me too. I don't want to be catapulted into a wall. I want my choice to lead to peace and not pain. Can I tell you to choose to trust your father who creates the gift and knows how it works? He's a manufacturer. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. So I want to say something to you right now. So maybe you're here. I'm not trying to say everything from the series, and you're holding on to that promise still. Maybe you still have it. I just want to celebrate you. Praise God. You live in a culture that kind of goes against that. If you're holding on to it, hold tightly to it. You're doing the right thing. It doesn't matter what people say or what people do. Hold tightly to that. But maybe you're here. And maybe this is the first time you've ever heard this instruction from God's word, and you become a follower of Christ, and you're saying this, I wish I would have known this. Before all the hurts, before all the heartache, before all the, I'm just grateful. You're like, Sean, why do we do a series about sex at church? Because I didn't hear a series about sex at church, and I made some bad decisions. My hope is that I can get you to this to protect you from what the enemy wants to try to accomplish in your life. You're like, I just wish I knew this before. Can I tell you that even though you may have not known it before, you know now, and you can make a choice today, and God can redeem everything that you made in the past? That God is still for you. He's not shaming you or condemning you. And and you may have more baggage than the people that are holding on to it, but God can still work through you and do immeasurably more than you ask or imagine. And maybe you're here today and you're like me, who was raised in church, who heard the instruction. Maybe you heard your parents talk about it or people encourage you about it. And you still chose, like Avery, to push the limits. You see, you got to understand, some people in here are like, yeah, well, what's the pastor know? He's like the goody-goody two-shoes. He hasn't been in my shoes. You'd be surprised. I'm standing up here. If we're a church that's honest, humble, and open and transparent, I lost my virginity when I was a teenager. I had a porn addiction for 10 to 12 years. So I'm not talking to you from someone who has no idea what you're going through. I'm talking to someone who's been on both sides of the fence, and I am living proof that God's way is better than the other way. You, got, you can't just take my word for it. You got to go to God's word. But I pray that you wouldn't feel condemned wherever you are, no matter what decision you are. If you've given it up, if you've pulled it. I want to read you one scripture in Joel. In this scripture, it's about these Israelites. And they had their harvest and their plants destroyed by locusts. God actually sent the locusts because of their disobedience. Their disobedience, you can take that down for a second. Their disobedience actually led to God sending these things. And it took out the harvest, but not just for one year. They took out the seed, so it lasted multiple years. No provision, no food because of their disobedience. Now, in the Old Testament, God sent these things from their disobedience. In the New Testament, because of our disobedience, God sent Jesus. He didn't send locusts. He sent Jesus. He didn't send locusts. He sent Jesus to pay our price on the cross. So if you have had a one night stand, If you have made the choice to go against God's word, he didn't send locusts to eat you up. He's sending Jesus to give you a second chance. Joel says this in 2.25. God says, I know they did all this, but now 
I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent among you. What is God saying? I know you may have lost years. I know it may have been painful years and you feel like you can't get back up, but our God can restore the years that was taken from you in a moment and take this from someone who has allowed the Holy Spirit to take the pornography out of his life. I was stuck with pornography for 10 years in the Holy Spirit freed me. I was given the sexual immorality and God has freed me. If he can free me, he can free you too. But you're going to have to make a choice today. You're going to have to say, it's for me and my house. This is the path I'm going. The Holy Spirit, I need your help today. Come on, let's stand on up. If you believe it, let's make this a declaration as a church. We're bringing sexy back. We're going to follow God's teaching. We trust in him. Come on, let's sing it.